going. Um, you know, just kind of a personal story. So I've always been interested in this bird's eye view to, you know, sort of look at problems. We know as, as uh, many of these questions we're asking, if we could just get up and see the target from above and, and kind of change the view from our, our ground sort of human-based view. And so I started actually in 1998 flying kites with a camera and it was very kind of, it seemed very crude you know, and we would fly with this radio triggered Olympus camera, maybe people remember, and it was really, uh, you know, basic sort of the button would be pushed manually by a servo. Um, but it was it and, 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 you know, the geometry wasn't really great for the sort of multiple views we need for photogrammetry, but it, it started working. And, and, and this was the case where we might take, you know, tens of pictures but we got one or two useful ones. So it was kind of a lot of work for, you know, a single useful picture, like in this case, the setting of this trench with uh, these fault traces going through it. So this was a paleo seismology application, but you can see sometimes the, dro the, the drone, the kite would be, it would be so windy, it would whip the camera. So we'd get a interesting view of the horizon. Um, you'd see it would crash. So Eagle Eye One here is slammed into the ground, and here we are trying to see what's going on. So this was this was the first attempt. Here's another one we started working on 2013, where we were flying another kind of a kite, but this was an auto kite. So it was an autonomously flying kite with a motor and a camera, and we were flying around this cinder cone. But uh, we we had and also we had some of the early drones. We had these three D robotics drones, which were very underpowered and they crashed all the time. Uh, and and we struggled to build good models. And so we had this sort of Frankenstein model of the cinder cone, where you can see a couple of different uh, groups of of survey data had to be kind of glued together. But we were making progress. And so, so what we, you know, we realized then was this need for, you know, having topographic data with sufficient extent and resolution to capture whatever we're interested in, but also we need it in time. A lot of times there's change. So we need it, let's say, to repeat to measure some change. So one example of some really beautiful drone data from 2016 is this one from the Kaikoura earthquake in, in New Zealand. And I don't know, it's sort of jumpy sometimes in, in Zoom to watch a video, but this is this video flying along the surface rupture. So this is an analogy for many of the things you all are interested in is how do we capture this really fine, intricate scale of a feature of interest so that we could map it and document it? And maybe how do we do it twice because there was change? Um, and so this is an example of the, the feature of interest. Um, and so, you know, the technology then is, is here is sort of 3D imaging with cameras and lasers. And we have kind of space-based approaches, which is shown on the left where there's photogrammetry. So reconstruction of the environment from photography, but also laser-based and even radar-based systems are, are used for from satellite platforms. But what we're mostly gonna talk about and what we've spent the most time on is the airborne, from person, you know, crewed aircraft. And then now we've really gotten into the structure for motion with the balloon and, and UAS platforms. And you can see, you know, sort of the difference between the laser scanning of the targets from both airborne and terrestrial settings, and then the sort of low altitude or ground-based structure for motion sort of photography of the targets. And this paper that Johnson et al. was one that we worked on to sort of assess the quality and, and kind of compare structure for motion results with airborne laser scanning results. And, you know, try to also talk a little bit about this critical sort of meter scale as one that we're interested in, or even less than the meter scale. And, and also kind of very fine, how do we, you know, I think that's the real frontier is going to repeat survey, but it's actually harder than you think because a lot of times you want to align repeated surveys and that is, is really the hard part. So an, just another example of our challenge, and this is again from earthquakes, but it's analogous with many kinds of studies where, you know, let's say you have a magnitude seven earthquake. And so it's going to have a rupture length based on this kind of historic scaling of, you know, almost a hundred kilometer long earthquake. 
which is a big thing. But the same magnitude seven earthquake is going to have kind of meter scale displacements, kind of like that video I showed from Kaikoura. So this is our challenge. It has a big outer scale. We need to cover things that are kilometers long, but with a very small measuring stick, like less than a meter. And what we see even in the structure from motion world is that we're down at 10 centimeters or one centimeter. So uh, we're dealing with a lot of data. So let me just clear that those drawings and move on. Uh, and so, you know, here's a, a little bit of a question for you also. Why is it that the coast of England or Britain gets longer the shorter the ruler? And, well, fractal is part of it. Fractal means, you know, that's the how the length changes as the ruler length changes. But that more basically, it's it the the um, point I think is that if you have a small ruler, you can easily measure the finer intricacy of the shoreline. And so that's what we need. That's what the structure from motion or the LIDAR gives us. These, these new technologies is let us is give us very small rulers so that we can characterize the features of interest at the scale of, of interest. So yeah, high resolution, Arpita says. So, um, so, and then the other thing from a geoscience kind of research standpoint, as well as applications, is that we see it's just kind of exploding demand for this kind of capability. And so this is just a survey of reports that are more leaning on the research side, but, you know, elevation for the nation, landscapes on the edge, new research opportunities in earth sciences, hydrologic sciences, volcanological research, general earth science research, geophysical instrumentation, NASA points of view and the USGS all know that these are, this is what we've got to do. And, and so it's, it ranges from, you know, from teaching to academic research to uh, industrial applications. So science motivations uh, include these, and, and these are just questions we might ask that then we would need the tools of structure for motion to try to answer. So, you know, how do geo patterns on the Earth's surface arise and what do they tell us about processes? How do landscapes influence and record tectonics and climate? What are the transport laws that govern the evolution of the Earth's surface? How do faults rupture throughout the earthquake cycle? And what are the implications for earthquake hazard? Landscape and ecosystem dynamics, volcano form and process, changes in you know, domes, edifice flows. And then some of you, uh, we had a couple of uh, interests, I think, on, on kind of both economic geology, sort of how do we measure the sort of relationships in, of mineral, mineralization, also sedimentary architecture. So this is, you know, the, this very broad set of interests here. Let me just push on here. So, so there's been really a kind of a couple of revolutions that have happened. I'd say there's sort of three that have helped us get to this point. And I'll talk in the next lecture a little bit on the algorithm side or the software side, but it's how do we, you know, we do the structure from motion itself. This is one breakthrough. The second one is computational. So maybe some of you all are Big Bang Theory fans, but, you know, Sheldon uses one of these Alienware desktops. So basically the gaming, gaming sort of industry has driven the high performance computing for the desktop and even for, the, for your hands, for your tablets. And that gaming technology, those needs for sort of big memory, fast CPU, fast GPU are what are required to do the 3D calculations that we're talking about today. The, the, and then the third revolution is, is in the platform. So our, you know, especially when we talk about these air, airborne platforms, uncrewed aerial systems, you know, both the copter based, the multi rotors and the fixed wings are have really improved a lot. And, you know, this this white quad rotor here, the DGI, you know, is industry leader, it's just as really amazingly reliable and accessible technology. And then from a, a teaching standpoint, you know, it's it's or, and geoscience it's our part of our toolkit you know and so here my students are doing kind of traditional geologic mapping but we're gonna we've already started to incorporate our uh, photogrammetry in our teaching because they need to know it 
So here's just a kind of a couple of examples, something uh, been on my mind, some my research. So here we are in actually in, in East Africa in the Afar depression, part of the Northern uh, East African rift. And we're doing, uh, you know, field mapping of detailed sort of structural geology, but also the setting for paleontology. So, uh, and you can see the, the sort of upper right here is the product, the final geologic map that we made that shows this, this the geology sort of being downfall to dragged against this horse right here of basalt. But then there's some, some tephras that give us age control and a site where we had found some important fossils. But to get to this map, we used our drone-based system to gather the aerial photography we did ground control so you can see this little cross right here of rocks with number 12 which we use then differential gps to to locate you see the lower picture here with the blue rectangles or the the pictures that's a screen cap from agisoft their meta shape that you guys will become familiar with and then we make then a sort of 3d view here of the um the topography with the overlying sort of draped ortho imagery. Here's just another example, very different, but something I was working on. This is a volcano in Indonesia called Sinabung, and it's been erupting and, and it sent this really huge viscous lava flow out on the side. And so from we had digital elevation model data from the our Indonesian collaborators, which was from before the lava flow came out. And then one of the PhD students that we worked with here, Brett Carr, who's now graduated, uh, he drove around in all these villages here, sort of surrounding the volcano where the blue dots are and took many ground, ground photographs. That was it. He just took lots of high quality photos from the ground. And then what he was able to do was build a 3D model, like what is shown here in this, uh, sort of left view, not the inset, but from those pictures, he built this 3D model. He then aligned the two surveys, the before and after on, on portions that hadn't changed, and then we differenced it. And so we can see here the thickness of this lava flow. So this is a hundred meter thick flow. You can see in these cross sections, how the flow structure changes from being kind of confined within levees to spreading at the bottom. And then we also hung some thermal data on this. So that's another key thing is using these geometric models to stick other observations on. And so finally, this lecture ends with just the point that we're sort of moving into a time of ubiquitous point clouds and 3D models. So everything around us is being measured at really high resolution. Uh, we see, you know, these self-driving cars are producing gigabytes per second in navigation data. The view on the upper right is structure from motion from tourist photography. And we'll talk about this in the, in the next lecture, but basically all the people who are in downtown Prague, when they put their pictures up to a uh, internet photo collection like Flickr, those could be downloaded and then used to compute the 3D view of the faces, the sort of facades of the buildings and where all the tourists were. So, you know, I call that sort of more haphazard sort of integration of the data versus sort of more planned. Uh, and, you know, we need good computational backbone to, to support this. And, and in open topography, we've been doing some of that work, but it's a, it's a big challenges to sort of support it. And to, you know, but at the same time, it's kind of the sky's the limit here.